Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. So uh, just yesterday as I'm recording this, uh, I am recording this video a couple of days in advance, um, but just yesterday as I'm recording this video, I put a Q&A post up on my community page asking for your questions for a video and this is the video in which I answer those questions. So uh, thank you to everyone who has asked one. If you do wanna ask a question for a future Q&A video, um, I basically always ask for the questions for these videos on my community page. So um, turn your notifications on for or community posts if you want to um, see that on your feed and uh, have the opportunity to ask a question. But thank you to everyone who did ask a question. Uh, I think we've got about 14 or so, so I'll see how many I can get through in the video. If I don't get to your question, I apologize, but I will try to get through as many as I can. So uh, let's kick it off with Bob Ross. Who do you prefer, Buffett or Munger? Um, I would say that I have probably learned more from Buffett, but I have also learned a huge amount from Munger. So um, if we're talking investing, um, I'd have to go with Warren Buffett. If I wanted to go fishing with someone, I'd probably go fishing with Charlie Munger. How's that for an answer? So uh, thanks for your question, Bob. Uh, next question is from JJ. How many positions do you currently hold and what percentage is each position and how much cash do you have? Yeah, so um, I think I have currently about five positions plus an ETF holding that I've kind of just had forever. Um, and in terms of cash, that's a really weird one for me at the moment. So um, I'm looking to buy a house and I basically have uh, a deposit set aside for the maximum possible amount of house I will buy, if that makes sense. So um, for us, that's probably about $800,000. So um, we need a 20% deposit and I'm contributing half of that. So I have about $80,000. You can do the maths on, on that kind of sitting on the sidelines at the moment, which for me, I'm still fairly early in the investment journey as a sizable amount of cash. Um, so if you exclude that, I have actually very, very little cash at the moment. Um, the, the sort of portfolio money, money that I'm just free to invest, um, without affecting my ability to buy a house, uh, is basically all in the market just about at the moment. Uh, that said, I have, you know, regular savings that will push that cash percentage up and I don't expect that we will buy that much house. Um, so there may be some cash that gets unlocked maybe over the next few months when we hopefully go through that process. Um, but that's kind of where I'm sitting at the moment. So five positions is probably about as low as I would want to get it for being fully invested, but I'm also sort of not fully invested depending on how you look at it, if that makes sense. So a um, bit of a strange time for me to answer that question, but that's kind of where, where things are, are currently sitting at. So uh, next question is from Meow Chinchilla. What a, what a username and what a profile picture. I'm, I'm liking that. Um, how old were you when you got into investing and what got you into investing? Yeah, so uh, I bought my first shares when I was, I think, 22 years old. So uh, back in 2017, that would have been about four years ago. Um, what got me into investing? Um, yeah, I think I've told the story on, on the channel a couple of times or maybe on, on podcasts, but basically for me, I was a few months into, into my first job, uh, kind of out of university, had a few thousand dollars saved up. Um, and I was just like in my head doing some mental maths one day thinking, you know, if I earn this much per year for the rest of my life and at the time I just I didn't even compute that, you know, my income may go up over time, but that's how I was kind of thinking through it. I thought if I earn, you know, X amount of money over time and I work for 40 years and I can save some percentage of that, <clears throat> then the savings number I'm going to get to at the end when I'm 65 or, or whatever um, is not actually that high and <laughs> probably not enough for me to live on, you know, just living off the interest in the bank as I was sort of thinking about it uh, at the time. So that's kind of what, what got me into investing. I, th I thought, you know, there must be some sort of missing ingredient here where things are not quite adding up. So um, that's how I got interested in investing. At the time, I wasn't in a position to invest in real estate or anything. So <clears throat> I discovered shares, uh, which kind of sent me down the rabbit hole of initially ETFs. Uh, and then finding Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Manish Bry, Phil Town, all these people. Uh, and that's kind of where I got to where I am today um, in terms of my investment philosophy. So um, yeah, it's been about four years into it now and that's kind of how I, how I got started. So thank you for your question. Uh, Jeremy B, do you ever sell options? Uh, no is the answer to that. I am kind of interested in the strategy of selling put options, kind of like Phil Town does. Um, but I don't have easy access to options here in New Zealand. And the other thing that's actually kind of a complicating factor in New Zealand specifically, um, and I'm not an accountant or a tax professional or anything, so I don't take this as advice, but um, 
there's also sort of two ways that you can be classed from a tax perspective in New Zealand. So you can either be classed as a trader or an investor. And I think if I were to get into buying options, I might be pushed into the trader um, kind of category. And that actually has some kind of negative tax consequences versus being a, a long term investor uh, in the eyes of the IRD. So that is that is something that I haven't done to date. Uh, but yeah, I actually don't even know if I, I can get access to options. I would have to check out the different platforms that are available. But um, I think that would be something that's kind of tricky to achieve. So I just haven't really spent any time looking into getting access to that. So I uh, appreciate your question. Uh, next question is from Toby Wiggins. Are you waiting till you finish the Alibaba book before you think about investing? Uh, yeah, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think Brandon from New Money <laughs> featured me on the channel. Uh, and if you're a hardcore follower of us both, you may have picked up uh, a little hint that I might have bought some shares in Alibaba. Uh, and that is true. So I have bought uh, some shares in Alibaba. Um, it was basically a shameless clone. So this really isn't something I usually would do. Um, but the list of famous investors that I really uh, admire that had invested in Alibaba uh, at or above current prices when I was looking at it um, was very long. So you had Charlie Munger, Monish Pabrai and uh, Greg Alexander kind of being the big three names in there. Um, so I basically did a shameless clone. It was a small position and that's the only position I have in Alibaba at the moment. Um, but I'm trying to figure out more about it. I'm spending a lot of time trying to dig into Alibaba at the moment. Like you say, I've been reading the <clears throat> the book um, Alibaba, The House That Jack Ma Built, which has been very, very helpful to get a bit of a history lesson on Alibaba. Um, but that book is also a few years old now and it covers aspects of the business uh, or it doesn't cover aspects of the business like Alibaba Cloud in, in much depth. Um, I have got about 50 or 60 pages to go. Maybe I have, have just haven't got to it. But um, I have been doing a lot of work on it behind the scenes. So I feel pretty comfortable with the e-commerce business at the moment. So um, Tmall, Taobao and so on. Um, I have a friend, luckily, who actually lived and worked in China um, and was literally working in market research around different e-commerce platforms, which is a very, very helpful contact uh, to have. So shout out Johanna if you're watching. Um, we had a couple hour call the other night to kind of get me familiar with the different platforms and also some of the competition in the e-commerce space. So, you know, how does JD.com fit in? How does Pinduoduo fit in? Um, how do some of the uh, smaller platforms like Little Red Book fit into sort of this full e-commerce world? Um, so I feel like I've got e-commerce pretty well down. Um, in terms of payments, I think I've got Alipay versus WeChat Pay, which is 10 cents product, uh, down pretty well. I probably haven't got fully into the rest of the financial services that Ant Financial uh, offer, which Alibaba owns a third of, uh, and I really haven't got to the cloud um, business in too much depth just yet. So a few things for me to keep working on there, um, but I'm hoping to actually do a deep dive on the After Dinner Investor podcast with Jason from the After Dinner Investor. Um, Mid-July we've got that scheduled for, so um, yeah, working pretty hard on trying to get my head around Alibaba at the moment. Uh, it's not the simplest business in the world, and obviously, um, you know, being in New Zealand, trying to understand a Chinese business has its own, you know, other set of challenges to, to try and get my head around local culture and so on uh, also. But um, to answer your question, I do have a small position in Alibaba. Hopefully I can get my head right around it. And if the price is still attractive, um, which is something I will be able to make a more informed call on once I've, once I've done that work, um, I may or may not add more. We'll, we'll just have to see. So appreciate your question. Uh, yeah, another question sort of on the Alibaba topic here from Vagabond, Naspers versus Alibaba, which is better. Yeah, so Naspers, um, Monish Prabhai has been talking about a lot. That's basically him talking about Tencent only being able to sort of buy it at a discount via Naspers, which is a South African media company, which uh, made a very early investment in Tencent. And um, I, again, haven't looked at too much at Naspers in too much depth, but my understanding is you can effectively buy 10 cent shares at a discount, not financial advice or a stock tip there. Um, so yeah, I'm working pretty hard on Alibaba at the moment, so I can't comment too much on Naspers slash 10 cent, other than what I've come across with uh, WeChat and WeChat Pay um, in my Alibaba research, which WeChat and WeChat Pay is owned by 10 cent slash Naspers. So uh, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that one. So I appreciate your question. Uh, next question is from Super Red XIII, or is that Super Red 1313? I, I 
don't quite know. Um, <laughs> what your portfolio return of the past five years or since you start with position, show the recipe. Um, okay, so um, I've been asked the question about portfolio returns, I think on the last q and I've been asked it a couple of times, and I think it might have even popped up twice in here. So um, I will answer it again. Basically, um, I've never shared my full investment track record on the channel. I certainly will at some point, but the reason basically that I haven't done it is because I don't think it's a meaningful length of time to for the track record to, to mean anything. So um, like I mentioned earlier, I've been investing since about 2017. I really didn't buy my first what I would call value stock, uh, which was Thor Industries uh, in late 2018. Um, so really for full years, you only have 2019 and 2020 so far. Um, and even 2019, it was still kind of a, a building phase of getting you know more than one stock in the portfolio that kind of fit my strategy. So um, I, just, I just don't think it's long enough to be meaningful and I don't want it to be one of these people that comes out like last year, I, I did have a very good year. And I don't want to come out and just show you my 2020 performance and say I'm the best investor in the world and all this stuff. Because I think one year performance is pretty meaningless to be perfect honest um, ideally you want you know a great compounded annual growth rate over a 5 10 15 20 30 year period right so um, maybe once I get five years into a, a good portfolio track record I will share that uh, on the channel but that's kind of how I'm thinking about it at the moment so appreciate your question um, Next question is from Annette Cross. How did you get into value investing? Would you talk about the growth and development of your portfolio? Yeah, so um, already touched on, I guess, a bit the journey of getting to um, the philosophy that I'm kind of at now. It was just natural progression after natural progression of finding different people and different investment strategies that I kind of gelled with and so on. Um, so that's sort of how I got into value investing. It was like, I need to find something that's not real estate. Okay, found individual shares and ETFs, then found Phil Town, Munger, Buffett, Pabro, and so on. And um, those value investment strategies just made sense, frankly. So that's, that's the way I chose to go. Um, and in terms of the growth of my portfolio, yeah, a significant chunk of my net worth is in the stock market. So um, that, that number will hopefully continue to get greater and greater over time. And I really like uh, investing in shares as a way to uh, grow my net worth over time. So um, yeah, it started out with a couple thousand dollars and now it's become uh, a lot more significant and I hope it becomes more significant and we can hopefully add a few zeros to, to that portfolio uh, number over time. So uh, thank you for your question. Uh, next question is from Joel. Uh, if you were going to only invest with a fund manager, who would you go with and why? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think in a perfect world, I'd probably get in a time machine back to the 1950s and give a young Warren Buffett my money, but um, I'm guessing that that's not an option with your question. Um, so really, I guess a couple of things I would look for, people that basically have the same strategy as me, um, which really narrows it down to a very small number of investors. And I want people with uh, a fee structure that is sort of aligned with investors. So I don't want someone who's just getting paid purely for assets under management and is more of a salesman than an investor. Um, so that really narrows the, the choices down a lot. Um, I would probably go with someone like Monish Barayo Guy Spear who runs a 0625 fee structure. Uh, they're long-term oriented, have a very similar strategy to myself, um, and yeah, are doing a, a great job and are very transparent with their investors and, and what they're trying to do. So probably Guy Spear or Monus Probri, it's kind of hard for me to, to pick between those two, but uh, someone like that would, would be great. Uh, Hanro Roos, uh, apologies if I'm butchering your name, uh, what are your thoughts on Alibaba's financial numbers being accurate as Chinese companies are notorious for cooking their books? Monish mentioned years ago that there are three sets of books, one for the government, one for the owner's wife, and one for the owner's mistress, so I'm wondering how he overcame this risk before investing in Baba. Uh, good question, and I mean, I think we just kind of have to put a bit of trust that they are going to be correct. I mean... Alibaba is a massive profitable business and it's kind of like a crown jewel of the Chinese government. So um, I don't think that they would want to even put themselves in a position to potentially get pulled up for fraudulent behavior, but um, it is an added risk. I mean, when you invest in a US company, you have very well audited financial statements, um, you know, audited by um, Deloitte or PwC or you know one of the big financial one of the big accounting firms in the US and globally at this point point. Um, and I don't think you 
get that quite as much with um, Indian companies probably as the other big one in that category but potentially potentially also China so um, I, I'm sort of thinking that I'm just going to outsource that one to to Charlie and to Monish and to Lee Lu because Lee Lu has been a shareholder in Alibaba before as well um, but it's an added risk and it's a very very good point that you bring up so uh, thank you for your question. Our next question is from Yougal. Uh, again, apologies if I'm butchering your name. Uh, Berkshire.B was created as the 130th value and voting power at the time. What has caused the price of Berkshire B to fall uh, so far behind Berkshire A? Is it not 130th of Berkshire A anymore? Um, yeah, I think I may have seen this question pop up somewhere else a couple of weeks ago. So um, I actually did some digging at the time. I'll just put up a screenshot here, which will basically answer your question. So um, I think that Berkshire Hathaway have come out twice at this point and basically uh, sort of restructured the percentage ownership of a B share relative to an A share and also the voting rights. So. Um, I'll put up the, the exact details on the screen here so you can see that. If you just go to Berkshire Hathaway's website, you'll see when they've done that. So um, yeah, it may have started out at 130th, but that ratio has changed over time. So um, you can go along and, and check that one out if you're interested. Um, even if you're just for that 130th, which like I say has changed now, but even if you're just for that amount, you will sometimes find that the A shares trade at a very, very slight premium to the B shares. Basically, that's because you can convert A shares to B shares, but you can't do it the other way. So if you're someone that has, say, one share worth $400,000 in Berkshire Hathaway A, um, it's very hard to sell a small chunk of that, right? So you can convert it to B and then sort of sell off small amounts of that $400,000 ownership to um, slowly liquidate that investment to, you know, live on or whatever you need the money for without having to just get out of Berkshire altogether. So that's sort of why the B shares were introduced. They were also introduced because people were actually setting up investment partnerships purely just to uh, allow people to buy fractional ownership in Berkshire A and charging fees which which Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger weren't a fan of so um, that's something to to keep in mind um, and Berkshire Hathaway A shares also have um, stronger voting rights than the B shares even um, adjusted for their ownership so that again is why they may trade at a, at a slight premium so thank you for your question there uh, next question is from Profit Margin Investing. Have you looked into NASPERS or Process? Uh, which company would you say has a better chance of unlocking shareholders' value? Yeah, um, uh, apologies, but I'm probably just going to have to defer you to the previous answer to the NASPERS question. So um, I've yeah come across NASPERS, uh, which is really just looking at Tencent is the way I view it after hearing Monish Pabrai talk about it. I've come across Tencent in my Alibaba research where uh, Tencent and Alibaba are sort of competing against each other. Um, so that's about the extent of my knowledge of Tencent at this point. Um, so I haven't sort of gone down to the next level of, okay, let's buy Tencent and let's find the, the cheapest way to own it, which I think is is how Monish Pabrai is sort of viewing NASPERS. So um, yeah, I, I really haven't looked into that. And NASPERS versus Process, which I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, again, haven't, haven't had a chance to look into that uh, at this stage. So uh, apologies if that wasn't particularly helpful, but uh, that is that is just sort of where I'm at. Uh, next question is from Bugalugs NZ1. What do your family and friends think of your investing and channel? Do they invest too? <laughs> yeah, so this is a really interesting question. I think when I first started out, um, I mean, everyone has always been super supportive um, of the investing channel. I think a lot of my friends uh, and maybe even some of my family thought I was a bit of a weirdo when I first get, got started, and they probably still think I am, but thought I was a bit of a weirdo when, when I was getting started and getting like five or 10 views and you know putting all this time into creating YouTube videos. Um, but as it's sort of steadily grown over time, um, you know, people have gotten more and more, you know, supportive of, of what I'm trying to do, which is very cool. Um, and um, yeah, anyone that I've kind of mentioned it to in, in real life thinks it's super cool that I've got this YouTube channel with, you know, all these um, really supportive subscribers that, that like to watch me um, talk about investing because no one else wants to listen to me, right? So um, yeah, they've always been really supportive. So um, thank you. Shout out to any friends and family that might be watching this video. So um, thanks for your question there. Uh, Ruben G, how do you decide on the discount rates you use when discounting future cash flows for valuation purposes? Also a long time fan of yours. Thank you very much, Ruben. Um, yeah, in terms of discount rates, I basically just outsource that question to Monish Pabrai. So um, I basically use a discounted cash flow template uh, with some minor adjustments um, in terms of how I treat excess capital. Um, I basically use the discounted cash flow template from the Dando Investor, which is 
not a particularly original way of doing the discounted cash flow. Um, but Monash Bri basically just uses a 10% discount rate and uses anywhere from a 10 to 15 times free cash flow sort of terminal multiple. So there are more advanced ways and fancy formulas to figure out uh, terminal values and try and come to a judgment call on what sort of discount rate you, you should be using. My view on that is that if you're having to fiddle around with discount rates and terminal values too much to try and make a stock look undervalued or whatever, it's probably just not cheap enough. So, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not trying to buy um, a dollar for 95 cents. You know, if I think something's worth 100, I'm not trying to buy it for $95 and I'm not trying to sell it at a, at a $102 or something. Um, I'm looking for things that are worth $100 and are going to be worth $200 in the future and I can buy it for $40 or something, right? So um, if it gets to that sort of level of discrepancy of um, price and value, uh, you know, changing a discount rate from 10% to 8% to 12% or changing a um, terminal value multiple a little bit is really not going to have a huge impact on, on the numbers that you come up with. So um, that's sort of how I think about it. And that is the final question. So we got through all of them today. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who did ask a question. I do hope you enjoy it. I, I do like putting these uh, more casual sort of Q&A videos together. So thanks for asking the questions. Uh, again, if you want to ask a question in future videos, keep your eyes posted for future community posts on the topic. Usually try to do these about once a month. So um, around the 25th or so of July, you'll have to keep an eye out for the next uh, community post that I put up asking for questions. But that's it for this one. I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit like and hit subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.